Yeah. So I will be fast. I have to cover Blinding. three topics. I want to talk to you about my research very fast. I want to tell you how we do it in BNP Paribas Fortis. I'm head of portfolio management for the bank. So I will tell you how it is in practice. You'll see that the theory and the practice never match. And then finally, I will tell you a little bit about my concept of being focused. So I will be very fast. Before I go into details, if this works, one second. It's moving. It's not right? Okay, first of all, I start with really bad news. I like to start my presentations with bad news. So, uh, and there's nothing you can do against this. So all the learnings that we have in our life, all what we learn, all what we know, all what I've learned, happens when you, uh, uh, about 60% happens when you are between zero and four years old. So you're little, you're learning a lot, like a sponge, okay, 60%. Guess what? Between 5 and 12, you have 35% more. So that, you know the maths. 95%, you know all what you had to know when you're 12. Meaning that just by, you have to be really, really lucky to learn something after you're 12. Okay? Uh, and there's nothing you can do. That's the way we're built. That's research, that's human. The message I want to give you is that no matter how good I try to be today, tomorrow you'll forget everything. And, and if you're really, really, really lucky, uh, maybe tomorrow night you still remember something. So the only way people learn is by doing something different. What do you remember from today? Whether you're a monkey, whether you're an elephant, what has that to do with the conference project management? Not really much, okay? But why do you remember? Because it was different. So what I will try to do is give you something in a different way, okay? So I hope that by tomorrow you remember something what I told you. Okay, but if you don't, don't worry, it's normal. <laughs> the second bad news, best said that, 90 slides. Last session of the day, 90 slides. So that's a huge challenge. I'm taking a big risk, okay? But I will try, I will, I'm sure at the end you will want more, okay? And <laughs> I will finish on time. Um, so about me, Antonio Nieto, I was born in Madrid, Spain, 42 years ago. I lived in Mexico, Germany, Italy, US, Holland, Belgium. And they say, I ended up in Belgium, now I live in Brussels. People say, you're Spanish, what the heck are you doing in Brussels? It's raining like here all the time. <laughs> and uh, well, the reason I ended up in Belgium, guess, love. I follow a woman. And that's the wrong thing to do. Uh, <laughs> then she left and I stay in Brussels. <laughs> She's living in Spain. <laughs> I live here, I don't know if you know Brussels, but this is like really the center. I live here, I work there. So I thought, great, uh, it's just 10 minutes walk. I had been commuting for years. I was working in Amsterdam, living in Brussels. So really, really messy. I said, finally, I will have some quality of life. 10 minutes walk, um, and then I will be healthy, it's good for the environment, and perfect. What happens is, unfortunately, I take my car. Why I take my car? Because I want to go to yoga after I'm done with work. And yoga starts at six o'clock. So I finish uh, uh, a bit, that's me at the end. I don't know the postures here very well. But I finish around six and the problem yoga starts also at six. So uh, at the end I don't walk and I don't go to yoga. But the intention is there. So the business case is there and, and I'm very committed to one day making it there more regular. Yes, so that's why I don't walk. I study in Spain, economics. I did an MBA in, in London. I work in Unisys, it's a telecom or a technology company in 95 or so in Amsterdam. And then I went into consulting. I don't know if you remember, Pricewaterhouse, one of the, at the time we were big six, now there's big four. And one thing that happens in my life, in career life, it's I somehow end up in all these mergers. Uh, uh, I don't know why, it must be unlucky or lucky, whatever. But I go through all these measures. So the first merger happened, end of 90s. Uh, we merged with Coopers and Libran. It was not too nice, um, but it worked out. In, in PwCs where we became very familiar with PMI, I started doing some research. I love research because I like to understand why things happen. And then you can tell and, and explain people. So I did some research on, on 
project management maturity at the time, 2004. But then, 2005, six, I was fired. And uh, it was very painful. I didn't expect it. The reason why I was fired is because PwC partners didn't believe in the value of project management. They say, forget it. Project management is done by external people, low, low fees. PwC cannot invest in a service around project management. That hurt me a lot. I could not believe these partners, business people, entrepreneurs, saying that what I was doing, it was not worth it. OK? Maybe it sounds familiar to some of you. I joined Fortis. This is a really little Belgian bank uh, in, uh, which wanted to be big and wanted to be really growing very fast. So we hired a CEO from Citibank, and the guy was really changing, transforming the company really, really fast. So uh, it was great to be there. They hired me to do uh, integration, so I was head of post-merger integration for a while. And my goal was to just integrate, or my target was to integrate companies, banks that we were buying in Poland, in Turkey, and so on. Then the second big merger happened in my life. We, for this little bank, together with a Scottish bank, RBS, and Santander, Spanish bank, we bought ABN AMRO. So that's like a Belgian bank banking, buying ABN AMRO, which is the biggest and one of the best companies in the Netherlands was really, really tough for them. The Dutch are very proud. I don't know if there are many Dutch here, but they're really proud. So they didn't take that very well. We pay a lot uh, and in cash, so it was a big mistake. But at the time, we thought we were rich. But if you look at the business case, there's a no-brainer. And, and we all talk about business case. This one was a no-brainer. 99.3% of the shareholders voted, yes, we should buy Avian Ambro. So that's a lot of people saying, yes, this is a good business case, OK? So we wanted to be like number four or five in, in a couple of segments in the world. So if we would take over Airbnb, it was making lots of sense. Yet, everything collapsed, OK? No matter if you have a really good business case, it doesn't mean that you will be successful. I did so many mergers that the, the guy from PMI, they say, hi, guy, how do you survive? So, they put me in one of these magazines once to say my secrets. You can't find it. Then I ended up in my dream job. So I don't know how, but they called me, hey, you want, we're setting up this portfolio management office. Uh, it's new. Do you want to try? Yes, yes, of course. So I was head, or I'm head of portfolio management. Transversal means for the whole bank. It's not for IT. It's not for operations, for the whole bank, which makes a difference. I'll tell you a bit later if I manage to be on time. I'm checking the watch. Hobbies, well, you know this one. Best set, I've been elected for PMI. I like to teach. I do little workshops with top management of companies to convince them that what we do makes sense. I teach in different business schools. I have a little blog on strategy execution. I have the book. OK, that's me, really fast. Now, no oh, way. Now to the content. This is totally different. So like I said, I was very, very annoyed and upset. I, even when I was working with PwC, going to customers, telecom, com, they didn't, the senior management, there's a glass ceiling. People don't really get what we do. So that frustrated me. I, I said I like research. So I tried to find out why these people on the, on the C-suite or senior executives, they don't get what we do. OK? I don't know if here, I heard a few presentations, British Airways, similar. So I think the issue is somewhere everywhere. I will tell you my views, why this happens, OK? So just relax and, and try to, uh, to, to take some things with you. Uh, so why? Why these guys? Uh, before I go, this is really important. I almost forget lucky. Uh, I don't know if you read a book which is called A Four Hour Week. It's, it didn't write it, but I like it because it says that you have to work four hours per week and the rest you do whatever you want. And the guy, it's true, and the guy is outsourcing part of his life to India. Like you would outsource your customer service, IT, you would do that. I check, and there's indeed some sites that you can outsource your trips, your uh, payments, you can outsource a lot. So I did outsource some of my research. 
to India. I found two companies. I asked them for a quote. One of the companies sent me the picture of Lucky, and they said, this is going to be your assistant. I didn't check the other one. I chose this one. <laughs> ah, guys, come on. You would have done the same. It was a bit more expensive. The point is that <laughs> the picture was not real. She's a famous actress in India. But I don't follow Hollywood, so she's really famous. Uh, but Lucky is the real name, so she helped me a lot on the research. That's why I mentioned her. So why? Why these guys who make millions are sitting on the board on top of the companies don't get what we do? Uh, and then if you look some research, uh, they were our CEOs of 90 companies. What are your strategic priorities for the years to come? And guess what they say? We want to go to new, new markets. We, not, we want to buy companies. We want to transform our business model. We want to whatever. This is ranking research. And guess what happens here, which annoys me even more, is that all these things, guess what? Become projects. In order to go to China and set up your operations in Brazil, that's a project. Yes? If you want to buy, we bought every number of big failures. It was a project. We sent 1,000 people, and we managed like a project. OK? Most of the ideas and, and, and intentions of CEO end up in projects. So why these guys don't really understand how important is what we do? OK? If you have questions, you can ask. Otherwise, I go really fast. OK? So then why? One of the research I check is I talk to Lucky. First of all, you know these guys? Have you ever seen them? I'm sure you did. Who's this guy? I'll just pick up a couple. On the top, come on, you're tired. Henry Ford, he developed the Model T, the car that, that was the beginning of the car. Uh, this guy, come on, Taylor. He's the father of scientific management. He was going to factories, and with a clock watch, he was checking how much time it would take you to nail uh, with a hammer. So he did really did scientific management really far, like 60, 70 years. This is Richard, Edward Deming, the father of total quality management, okay? beginnings of project management. The guy on top is the first business consultant. He's called Peter Drucker. So he wrote like hundreds of books. If Peter Taylor wrote late, he wrote hundreds. This is my role model. My, I want to be like him. You know him? He wrote like five horses. Five horses. Michael Porter. You know how much this guy makes for a session like I'm doing here? 200,000 euros for one hour. That's why I want to be like him. He, <laughs> I will write the book you just teach one day a year. And that's enough. Porter, it's true. Huh? I'm not joking. What I say is true. Uh, Mitzberger and uh, Michael Hammer, business process reengineering. So all of you have seen that. So I tell Lucky, can you check what these guys, gurus, who transform the way we do work, companies work, uh, say about project management? What do they say about projects? How, how should they manage projects? OK, Lucky calls me. She calls always around 6 o'clock. Bad timing for me because it's when I decide whether to go to yoga or not. But <laughs> Lucky calls me after a week of sending her the assignment. She's crying on the phone, crying really hard. And she says, Mr. Antonio, I fell on the task. Tell me, Lucky, what happened? None of these guys, none of the guys, I researched 13 guys, talks about project management. There's no single word. You can research the word project, you don't find it. In their books, in their papers, you don't see that. These guys never mention the importance of project management. OK? They only started to talk, the gurus, in the 2000s. So the whole decade, the century passed, nobody talked about project management. So that made to me a lot. So I said, lucky, don't worry. That's what I wanted to prove. Second test research. I said, where do the CEOs and the big leaders go to, to learn? Yeah, they have money. Where do they go? Harvard, in SEAT, yes? They go to Wharton, Kellogg, business schools. That's where they learn how to run a business. 
So I asked Lucky, can you research 100 top MBAs in the world? This is a ranking provided by Financial Times every year. So you should be on the top of the list. Can you check if they teach project management? I guess if a CEO goes there and they teach you, then you will understand. Lucky calls me at 6. Again, I was about to go to yoga. And she calls me. But she's crying again. She says, Mr. Antonio, I fell again. There's just two MBAs in the world on the top 100 who teach project management. Only two of the top 100 ask something mandatory. Nobody teaches you project management. You learn a lot of things, but not project management. It's not a course. OK, if you go down to other business schools, you will find it. But this is really amazing. I've written a few things around this. OK? I'm trying to convince the MBAs to teach it. So I send every year a reminder to the deans of these projects, uh, Harbor and Seat, guys, you should teach project management because it's really important. Yes, yeah. It's, and they understand, but it's very difficult to change that. It's true, it's true. They reply, they make sense, they all run parallel. Finally, the last test I, I will show you here because I don't have too much time. Consultants, who advises the CEOs? McKinsey, Bain, Boston Consulting, they charge about 8,000 to 10,000 euros per day. It's really expensive people. I don't know if you receive McKinsey quarterly. It's like a publication they, pu they put every, every week or so. You can look at the functions on what they talk about, and nowhere you find project management. Nowhere. It's not a function for McKinsey people. They don't advise on project management. They don't advise on portfolio management or program management. They don't care. Yes? And something which is very revealing, I don't know if you know Harvard Business Review, which is the Bible for the CEOs. When they're traveling, they read that in their jets or first class. Lucky research for me, you can see how many articles have been published since the beginning. We look at 50 years, and here's what matters. I teach at university, and I say, guys, if you want to have a career in a corporate, don't go into project management. Go into this. Marketing, finance, strategy, that's what matters. That's really, this is the test. This is what matters to CEOs. You can dream, we can dream, that we're important. We're not important. We're no, no, number 13 on the priorities. Number 13, OK? They can sell you whatever they want to sell you, but this is wrong. It's changing, and we're going to change that, but it takes time, OK? So 300 articles versus almost 5,000 5, articles in marketing finance strategy. That's what matters. Sorry to give you, again, bad news, but this is the reality. OK? I need a drink. How much time? I said I will be on time. Something which is another big thing which is really, really important from the research. And then I stop with the research. I talk about two things that you know, but this is when I speak with people who don't know. So there's two ways of looking at business. You have the run the business, the operations, the exploitation. Some people talk about it. You have the change the business. OK? This is normal. You know that. But there are two dimensions. Two, you need different people. You need different processes. You need different tools. And they're overlapping. OK? So far, it's clear. Yes? For these guys, uh, sometimes it's just revealing. OK? The issue is, OK, run the business comes pretty much from Porter, again, my I don't, uh, value chain. So you have primary activities, which is the uh, supply chain, and then you production, and marketing, and sales. And on the top, you have the supporting things, processes, HR. Then you have this usual organization chart, which we all know. But this is the way it is. So you have the commercial, the CEO, and then the functions, and so on. What happens is, for the run the business, you have these priorities. So sh it's always short-term returns. Yeah, you don't get big term. It's just for the day-to-day -day things. Is driven by commercial objectives. So you have to make the sales. Yes? That's the target. And that's the whole organization just working for that. Making the sales, making the efficiencies, cutting costs, 
uh, keeps the company alive is what makes your salary. Yes, the run the business makes our salary. Yes, that is again very, very important. The change doesn't make your salary. The run makes your salary. You can pay your people because you sell. Okay, that doesn't come with projects. Very, very important. Okay, you can invest in new services, new products, but it will take 12 months, maybe two years, maybe three years, maybe never to deliver any returns. Okay, the, but the growth is very limited. If you run your run only, you will not grow. You will just stay. You can increase your prices, it will kill you. You can sell more, it will kill you. So you cannot just do the run all the time. You need change. Okay? Clear? So the change is totally different. It works like this, like this, like this. And the issue is that the returns are only medium term, long term. You never know. ABN AMRO was great. It makes so much sense. We never make any penny out of it. Almost bankrupt, my bank. High uncertainty. But this is where the growth comes. Yeah? The iPhone is where the growth comes from Apple. And then it's kind of much more linked to strategic objectives. Okay, clear? The problem is that there's conflicting priorities. Who do you put here? How many people? What's the budget? How much you put here? Okay, so that makes a big, diff very, very difficult situation. You follow? I speak really fast, huh? With Spanish accent. So, so take a picture again. Go, go back, one step behind, macro level. And let's look at a company with the run and the change. Just one company. I take 100 years, OK? What happens is the guys here, who I told you before, they tell things to do to, to leaders. You should do this. You should standardize. You should implement an SAP. You should do whatever, OK? What happens is that there's a trend, but very little. And you will recognize when I say this. Every year, there's more people working in change Slowly, there's more projects because this is getting very lean. This is really efficient. You cannot make it more efficient. We've been working 100 years to make it extremely efficient. Yeah, SAP, ERPs, outsourcing, you take a piece, you send it to India. It's extremely efficient. Where does the growth come from the change? So more people are working in change. In my bank, we're 16,000. Uh, a few years ago, 2,000 were working in change. Today, 4,000 work on change, OK? We have more and more and more and more projects. More and more and more people working in projects. More and more and more budgets putting projects. OK? You follow? OK. When did project management start, the professional? IPMA, International Project Management Association, started in 65 in Switzerland. PMI in 69 in Philadelphia. Really, really babies. They're babies. You cannot change the way projects are managed so fast. The PM book, sorry, the PM book was only released in 87. Imagine, it will take 20, 30, 40 years before companies adopt it. 10 years ago, very few companies were talking about project management methodologies. Today, everybody has one, mostly PMI or Princeton. OK, so you see the big thing that is happening. A guy who's a good friend in the US says, the factory of the future will have only two employees, a man and a dog. The man will be there to feed the dog. The dog will be there to keep the touching the machine. This is the future. <laughs> yeah, you better be a dog sometimes, because you, we don't have too much future. <laughs> Another thing I research is that we look at 100 companies. And what you see, starting Walmart is the first one, is what you see here is that uh, basically all the strategies are very similar. They all want the same. Yeah, don't tell me there's a company who doesn't want to grow. Don't tell me there's no company who wants to expand or increase market share or be more sustainable or increase customer. This is are all the same. So the difference is in the execution. That's where the difference is, in when you choose what to do and then you go for it. So I will skip that, but here you can see I went into details on what the, are the strategic objectives of this. Walmart, for example, and you see the issue that they have is that this is a mix between change objectives and run objectives, and it's all mixed up. It's very difficult for people working in a company to really know whether you are executing because you're in the run or you're in the change. It's really mixed up. This is my next subject for research because I really want to understand how this works. So basically, 
If you want to increase market share by 5%, expand international to, to two emerging markets, you need to do it with these two sides. And that's what really is very, very difficult. It's difficult to balance, to find the right balance. First, to articulate the strategy and then link it to strategic objectives. That, if you read any book on portfolio management, what's the first thing they say? You should link all your projects to strategic objectives, right? You know that. For me, in practice, it's impossible. I have 150 projects. I don't have strategic objectives. We don't have a clear strategy. Start trying to link that 150 projects to strategic objective. It doesn't work like that. I bet there's very, very few companies who can do that, okay? The theory is really nice and makes a lot of sense. The practice is a mix up between change and run, okay? Don't want to disappoint you too much. There's good news at the end, <laughs> and it's not the drinks. So what happens? That you know. Okay, I've seen the level here, so this I will not spend too much time. This I use when I'm talking to people who don't understand, mainly CEOs and seniors. But there, it's, it's just the key is to have the right balance. And, and you have the, how I told you, most of the runs, the business are organized like this. The finance, I have a huge issue with finance. Let's go once into detail. My finance is run by a budgeting cycle. I don't know if you know what that is, but it's a yearly cycle. My projects last 12 months, but can last 18 months, three months. That drives crazy the finance people. I just get budget for what remains of the year. If you're lucky, you go back again to finance and they might give you budget for the remaining of your project. This is not how we work in the change. We need a budget for the whole 18 months. So finance, the organization, you see the PMOs, we all talk about them. Uh, process. We all talk about the tools, the PPM tools, and so on. The question is, where is the balance, and how do they connect? How can you get KPIs from the run that link to the KPIs of the change? Okay, that's the key, and that I have seen very, very few times to say no, nobody does that. Okay, clear? I have how much? Fifteen minutes, huh? Twelve. Twelve. <laughs> how do we do it? So the whole thing in BNP Paribas started because in banking we have cost income ratio. That's our KPI, how much you make, how much you cost. It's very simple, we're bankers, so we need to make it simple. We had a huge uh, cost income ratio of 71% in 40s. So they say we need to uh, align projects, we need to do less projects. Um, so the whole business case was to get a better cost income ratio. What I did, we worked like 16 months just to develop a process, demand management, portfolio management, and so on. We spent like eight months, I didn't see that talking today in the, but one of my biggest issue was to get the data right. Eight months, nine months, just getting good data. And not just data in the system, data that makes sense and is the quality. Six months to nine months, that's the first thing you need to do. I didn't expect that it would cost us so much, and we have clarity, we have PPM for six years. The quality of the data was a mess. People filling in their timesheets or just putting the project ID, the project description that somebody could read it, took us a lot of time. It's really, really, really complicated. I, I report to the executive committee, so I'm lucky to have that kind of platform. We had hundreds of reports. What I came to the conclusion is I need to make it really, 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 really simple. And I have like five minutes to convince them that what I'm doing makes sense for them. So we did uh, an analysis, an inventory of these 150 projects, and what I showed them is, guys, today you're spending 74% of your projects, about 100 million euros, in cost of optimization projects. 22 in compliance and risk. That leaves you just about 2% on growth projects. When I showed it to the CEO, he was crazy, angry, he says, how can we spend so much on this? We're going to be a very compliant and cost-efficient bank without customers. That's what the CEO told me. With one pie, I managed to get their attentions. I didn't talk about that project. I said, where are you investing your money? Okay, that created a lot, a lot of discussions. Emails, very late in the evening, how is this possible? Who is fault? We need to change that. 
So we agreed to have a balanced portfolio. This is the usual sort. Also, where are we spending? Who's spending most, retail or private client, commercial banking? No, IT and operations are spending most, 60 more percent. That also creates a big, big uh, storm in the bank. How people from IT, they're not making the money. We are making the money business. We should decide which projects we do. It sounds familiar. So we try to have something more balanced. The people were so excited. One thing more that I did, this you don't need to read from there, I'll tell you. <laughs> the first time ever in the history of the bank, in one A3, we had all the projects of the bank. They could see them. They could see them, they could feel them. Yeah, it's not really, really fancy stuff. I wish I could do something better and, and balance cost card, but they want something simple. So the first time I show the guys, this is what we're going to do. Prioritization exercise projects for next year. Okay, you see all the projects, you see the face, you see lots of gaps. The data was still missing after nine months of about 10 people working to get the right data. So guys, these are mandatory projects. We have to do it. It's Basel III, it's FATCA, it's so after all the crisis, we have to do them. There's no choice. You have to do it. Even replacing Windows by an upgrade, I have no clue. They have to be done. These are not mandatory, okay? We put them below. So it's not really it's rocket science. Again, the book will tell you, make a formula, weighted average, and so on. Doesn't work. We try to prioritize the non-mandatory with a formula, which didn't work because some people were pushing to have their projects, which I understand, and say, guys, this is where the money stops. There's no more money. You gave me the money, that's the money you have. So what's below here, you need to kill it or you don't start if it's a demand. Very simple. They were impressed that for the first time, with so much simplicity, they could understand what they were doing in portfolio management. Okay, clear? I can tell you a lot about this, but I don't have time. I need to go fast. This is what made me happy. I've been working two years very, very hard on this. And this is what made me the most happy. Not the bonus, because I didn't get any bonus. In banking, you don't get any bonus. On, this is the chairman of the bank, vice chairman. On, fir, on 1st March, the executive committee of BNP Paribas validated the project's portfolio. Of two, first time he writes ever in an email project portfolio. He didn't have a clue what that meant before. So that's already an achievement. Such a formalized approach to build the project portfolio of the bank is a premier in BNP Paribas Fortis, but also in the whole group, 200,000 people working there. First time we do that. In spite of the difficult going contrary, the executive committee recognized the significant progress brought by the new process, which really gives the top management the means to decide on the investment of the bank in full transparency and cooperation. This was great. He copied the whole exco, and I was really happy. Philip Dears, by chairman. What happened afterward, the reply, I can only join Philip in his praise. I think we still have some work to do. However, it's the first time in my youthful life that I have had the impression of constructive discussion and transparency with a real concern for strategy and cost. So a sincere thank you from my side, Peter. Peter is the CEO of retail banking. This guy is a killer, a bulldog. So if he supports you, he has never written a mail like this. So I was even more pleased. The guys at the top understand what we do. That was my biggest bonus. And now they want to see the pie. I cross them in this nice building, show me the pie. They want to see the pie. They want to see where we invest in the money. So very good. There's lots of issues to solve. I'm not going to cover them. How much? One hour. Ah, you see? <laughs> Five minutes? Now we come to the fun. So I th you see it's really a mess. It's not easy what we do in portfolio management. And it, it's my role, I think, more than putting process and tools, and which is important, is, is make, talking the language of the people at the top. And it not, had nothing to do with project management, portfolio management. It's trying to get an understanding of the business and, and be able to make the link with what we do. That's the most difficult part. We tend to go straight to the details and show Gantt charts and WBS. Guys, forget it. That's not what they need. So it's a mess. We have 120 projects, still a big mess. What I realized is, is that the key for all this is to be focused. 
Yeah, and therefore the name of my book is The Focus Organization Companies. I say companies who are focused and know what to do, they perform better, they achieve their results. If you try to do everything, you will hardly achieve very few things. I take this guy, you know him? This one you must know. I don't mind about the gurus, but this one you should know. Steve Jobs, yeah. So I take him as an example, as his company. Uh, what he says, and was mentioned in a few presentations before, is the most important decisions you make are not the things you do. That's easy. The most important decisions and the most difficult is decide which ones you don't do. We all want to do everything. It's very hard to say no. Focus means say no. That's the key. You have to learn to say no. And we have to focus on what you are good at. Forget about trying everything. And that's what he did when he came back to, to Apple. I don't know if you know the story of Steve, but he built his company. After 10 years, he hired an external CEO who fired him, coming from Pepsi, he, who fired him because he was a bit crazy guy. And uh, Apple was almost bankrupt. And then they, uh, 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 Steve went to uh, build this Pixar. Uh, Toy Story and then Nexus, which is an operating system, and then Apple bought back Nexus, and that's the new operating base. So Apple was back after 10 years. What he did when he came back, 97, he canceled 300 projects. He had 330 projects when he came. He canceled 300 projects in one week. Not in months, in one week, 300 projects. And of course, he was laying off people, but that's... He also reduced the pipeline, so he had about 40 products, he just ended up with four, two laptops, two desktops. Very simple, very focused. He put people working on where they should be. People who are good in design were working in design. People good in marketing were in marketing. What you see in company, my company, I often meet an HR person who was an IT director before, has no clue about HR, uh, or, or finance people working in IT. No, here in Apple, everybody works where it should be. You don't put a goalkeeper in football trying to score goals. The goalkeeper is trying to protect the goal, okay? So that's very important. Put the right people on the right place. And this is really rough, and I know we should be more environmental and so on. He was getting rid of the bad people. Uh, he always had a competitor. So he always focused on IBM at the beginning. We have to kill these guys. We have to beat them. And the good thing about Abel was not about cheating. He wanted to beat him by being better, by producing something better. Okay? That makes a difference. Why? Because the good competition in my bike, we compete internally. We're competing retail, it's competing with IT. That creates a lot of internal competition, very negative. With Apple, you focus on one and we need to beat them. So that creates a lot of focus on the people. Uh, urgency is key, you know that you're experts in change. He set up this biannual Apple Worldwide uh, Convention. Uh, it happens every two years, and it's where he launches the new products. And normally, if you talk to any developer, he will tell you, forget it, we can never develop an iPhone in two years. It will take us four. But he knew that, he put it in two years. Because when you stretch people, they deliver better and they're more focused. So he played a lot with the sense of urgency. You could not work too long in Apple. You were burned out quite easy. Strategy, he had a clear vision so that I don't need to develop. Something which I teach to my students is really important for all of us is to deliver clari clarity, um, quality. It's really, really important. I tell my, uh, my students, my work is to produce PowerPoint slides. It's very pathetic, but that's what I do. But I make sure that they're perfect, that the numbers match between the slides. When you have a sum, it's the same as sum in the other slide. The format, everything has to be perfect. There's like, I don't know, 85 iteration every time a slide goes to the X code. You have to really focus on quality. It's really, really important. With Apple, what is amazing is I keep the boxes. They're so well made that even the box, their package, it's amazing. So the guy thought about everything. And then the discipline. I told you about being taken over by French. It's about discipline. You need the discipline. You need to have that discipline to get the things done, unfortunately. OK, two more minutes, and I'm done. I'm looking, yeah? So focus, that's how I came to the concept. This is where Steve Jobs was fired in 85. Then he came back, 
and then you see the market share. So he really, really focused the company on just being the best at a couple of things. And that's the last part. This is something for you personally, individually, which I'd like you to finish with. I talk about the companies, organizations, and they're totally unfocused. What, uh, there's some other research saying that we are unfocused. You are unfocused. People tend to be really unfocused. Yeah, especially now with all these applications. So guys from Harvard, they researched 250,000 people. They realized that the highest performing people were the ones which were focused. Okay? Meaning focus is you focus on one thing and you do it. And often that thing is the most difficult task on your to-do list. But you really focus. Okay? And the thing is that these high performance were more happy. When you're focused and you're good at, you're happier than other people who are trying to be something and they never make it. So it's really, really, really important. This think about what are you trying to achieve? What do you really like? And try to be focused. Yes? And this is where the issue comes. It requires discipline. So uh, I have the problem. I told you I like yoga. And it starts at 6 o'clock. And this is uh, applicable to most of you. When you go to yoga, I, sometimes I, I'm, I could make it. Yeah? I leave the office five minutes before. I will be there at 6.2. So really, really, really tight. But I could make it. And my brain, if the, the weather is nice outside, my brain says, Forget yoga. Screw yoga. Go to a pub. Go to a terrace. Have a drink. You deserve it. That was the issue. My brain tends to go to the nice things. Yoga is tough. Yes? It requires discipline. But when I do yoga, the first moments are difficult, but afterwards I feel much better than if I would go to the drinks. Okay? So you need to push yourself. What means is that we tend to be go for easy things, to disorganize. That's our brains. Again, like I told you at the beginning, you cannot do much. You just need to train, 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 train. OK? Last thing, what I tell my students and, and the people, I, you need to focus on three things. You need to do what you're good at. It's really important that you find what you're good at. And there's all of you, you have things that you're good at. The other thing is that you need to like it. It's very important that you like what you do. I have a very, very good friend, a Spanish friend, Jaime. He works for a Japanese company. He's very good at uh, his controller. He is very good at finance. 15 years in finance, he hates finance. <laughs> really, he hates. He calls me every day, I want to change job. I want to change job. But he's really good. That's the worst thing that can happen, being good at something you hate. <laughs> really? No, yes. And then it should add value. It's very important that what you do should add value to you, to yourself, to grow, and to the company, of course. If it doesn't add value, stop it. Yeah? And that's it. That's why you will find the best performing part of you. That's how I found myself in portfolio management. I do what I like. I love it. I could do it for free. And I think it adds value. And that's where you find happiness as well. You're a happy person. OK? So that's how I wanted to finish. Uh, that's all. Just keep focus. It's very important. Thank you.